This is no barren, rocky hillside, but rather a garden tended by Sukhor people. Their way of life is an outstanding example of an old African pattern of adaptation to mountain environments, one that involves labor-intensive terracing of slopes and micromanagement of livestock and plants. Over time, this produces a cultural landscape. The Sukor home in the Mandara Mountains of northeastern Nigeria is a granitic plateau high above the plains. A hundred years ago, its steep slopes protected them against Sudanic states that raided the region's non-Muslim peoples. Access is by foot up ancient and finely engineered paved ways that the Sukkos say were built by giants. Of 15,000 Sukkor, 2,000 remain on the mountain. At the top of this paved way is the rock-built house of the chief, a place of shrines and paved passages entered through megalithic gateways. One of these leads to the chamber of Sukkor's council, comprising the chief, title holders, and male elders of Sukkor's 21 clans, which are land-holding kin groups. Chief Guzik's house is also undated, but much more recent than the many grinding hollows on boulders that go back thousands of years. Sukkor society has formed over the centuries, in part through immigration of individuals, families and clans. They make up a community that lives, works and celebrates together. This program, filmed over 17 years by two anthropologists, Nick David and Judy Stirner, follows the Sukkor year of 13 lunar months, beginning in the 12th. It is the last of winter. The air still holds Harmattan dust blown south from the Sahara Desert. It has not rained since October, and water is very scarce. The children unwashed. <laughs> A few good containers remain to be finished, but most Sukur are turning their minds to the next farming season. Smiths and their wives, the potters, form a caste, marrying amongst themselves. Their crafts are now much in demand. The month is named for the feast of the slaughter of the bulls. In his house, Tarahaji, one of six priestly title holders called Busifoy, oversees preparations for the festival. The bull has been fed for two years in a sunken stall. On the morning of the feast, elders gather outside Tada's house. He drinks millet beer with Dalata, also a priest and head of a former chiefly clan. Judy, the anthropologist, takes notes. Thank <laughs> you. 
After the sacrifice, Tara takes out a blood offering for God, Jigla, and the spirits. The next morning, as a room in the chief's house is thatched, the bull is butchered. Formerly dozens were slaughtered, and their meat shared through the community. Sukur is now less self-sufficient. Economic priorities have changed. In 2008, Tarahaji was the only celebrant. Change has also brought schools to the mountain. The thirteenth month is the hottest. Sheep and goats will soon be confined to stalls. Agricultural terraces are repaired, fields cleared and burned off, then fertilized with manure. The land, hot and dusty, may be refreshed by a shower or a flower, but it is too early to plant. Women walk far to collect a year's supply of firewood. Children climb hackberry trees to gather leaves, almost the only fresh greens available. There is now time for house construction, and a room is to be rebuilt in the house of the chief. Once rooms are ready, marriages take place, always within the caste, but outside one's own clan, and the bride can be led to the house of her husband's family. Very hot and increasingly humid, Tia Zung means moon one, usually corresponding with April. But here the calendar is tied to rainfall, not the sun. Months can be repeated or dropped. Only irrigated gardens are green, but nutritious dry grass on the plateau is not wasted. Cattle, some owned by Sukur, are pastured by visiting Fulani herders. Mahogany fruit are harvested and their seeds crushed and cooked to release oil used, often mixed with red ochre, as a body ointment. Until the 1950s, this was the time when everyone in Sukur, smiths and farmers alike, smelted iron in furnaces unique to this region. A smelt reenacted in neighboring Cameroon shows how it was done. The ore is magnetite, eroded from local granites. Ore and charcoal are charged to the upper hole while a bellows man forces air down a tube into the furnace shaft. In a day, a furnace could produce up to ten iron blooms, masses of metal, charcoal and slag. Sukur's furnaces have decayed since local iron was replaced by European stock and scrap in the late 1950s so fast that some were left with numerous blooms and iron bars that were traded and used as money. Towards the end of the month, there may be sufficient soil moisture for sowing sorghum and pearl millets by a technique here demonstrated by Muffa from across the Cameroonian border.
in the second month rain falls, unpredictably and irregularly, and a green flush clothes the terraces. Now is the time for a new wife's dowry and her family's gifts to be brought to her new home. <laughs> Sukur very rarely eat meat, but this is a special occasion. For their service, certain of the wife's relatives can demand payment from the groom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorghum sprouts quickly in Chief Guzik's fields, but so do weeds. He organizes a work party. <laughs> <laughs> Millet beer, both drink and food is prepared and served to the workers. The third month brings more regular rains. Beans and groundnuts are among many crops planted. Koini, a woman elder, has died in the night and will be buried this evening. Her husband's kin dig the tomb. In the cool of the fourth month, sorghum and pearl millet are growing tall. First weeding is complete. It rains 240 millimeters in a month. Minor crops need everyone's attention, but grinding grain is always women's work, though diesel mills now relieve most of this heavy labor. The flour will be cooked in boiling water to make the staple food a stiff porridge. Every two years, the coolest and wettest month of the year sees the initiation of young men. Almost everyone is busy with the second weeding of the millet fields and the planting of sweet potatoes and minor crops.
Meanwhile, the initiates are off in the bush or competing in tests of strength. They play flutes, once made of mahogany bark, but now of plastic tubing. <laughs> On the first day of initiation, candidates and their mentors gather in the council enclosure. Some come from Sukhor's upper wards, others from the lower. There is long-standing rivalry between them. Elders and mentors separate the two groups and the initiates are seated inside Chief Guzik's house. Hisuku, the chief's chaplain, prays for the initiates. Instructing them, Kazur, Go seek a wife. He blesses them with beer. A Busafoy priest leads the initiates to their special hill. After some crowd control, Delata is able to instruct them. In the evening, there is a dance on Patla the ceremonial area next to the chief's house. Initiates' mothers, red like their sons, are given money. Grandmothers wear crowns of vine leaves. <laughs> Initiation continues for three, five, or seven days. <laughs> On the last day, the initiate's hair is symbolically shaved by Hundu the smith. Everyone is getting ready for the final dance. Fathers, mothers and relatives salute the new man.
and as the new moon shows her face, the ceremony ends. In the sixth month, the rains are less, heads of sorghum and pearl millet are filling out, and maize in gardens next to the house is the first cereal to be harvested. The sukkur call farmers weeders, and with good reason. A small Sunday market supplements the main Tuesday market below the mountain. This is the month of Zoku, a ceremony of purification during which ancestors are fed and spirits of the dead driven off. Bosefway Tarahaji and Dalata climb Mihiri Hill to a shrine between two great rocks. Tarahaji prays to God. This offering is for Jigla. Bring health to the people. May they become as numerous as grains of ore. Take your food. This is my task, handed down by my father. Let the things that enter our houses through drains be not as snakes, but as earthworms before our children's feet. Spirit of this high rocky place, drive away evil. So be it. Formerly, a fine bull was sacrificed, but today those still of the old faith cannot afford it. Many Sukur have become Christians. This night, food and drink are set out for the ancestors. The next morning, Koje, Chief Guzik's wife, leads the women in discarding a broken gourd, ashes, and other symbols of the old year. An expedition of title holders, accompanied by the chief's chamberlain and smith drummers, sets off to drive out the spirits of the dead. They are led by Midala, the ritual war leader. Several times they stop to circle shrines. <laughs> they tell the dead to go to Dua, a Kapsiki village over in Cameroon. On their return journey, the expedition stops for refreshment before reporting to the chief. They clap, Amen. Through a hole in the wall of the chief's house, the war leader washes Chief Guzik's hands. If anyone harbors evil thoughts, let him discard them. Let all that grows on our farms double in abundance. May the children of Sukur be as healthy and as prudent as butterflies. In the afternoon, there is the annual full meeting of councillors held to resolve issues that might, as the Sukur say, spoil the village. <laughs> Shared understandings develop from shared experience.
The seventh month sees the end of the rains. There is now time for community work. Hundu is in his forge, making tools for the harvest. So called smiths make the full range of iron tools. The eighth month, still green at the start of the dry season, Sukur catches its breath. Where women once gathered iron ore, they now farm groundnuts as a cash crop and bring their chickens to forage in the fields. Older men grow tobacco next to the house. They dry the leaves, pound some, and sell the product as cakes of snuff. In this month, grass is harvested in great quantities for making ropes and plaited mats, baskets and roofing. So poor men plait elegant carrying baskets. Hey, hey, hey.
That's it, except for the frame. Sukur mats have replaced Sukur iron as a source of income and are sold widely in and beyond the region. The end of the month sees a ceremony, the coming to Pasla, which sets the stage for harvest. As part of the ceremony, men make covers for the chief's granaries. The war priest supervises the refurbishing of an altar made of old grindstones. Overflowing appears to symbolize abundance. <laughs> The coming to Pathla ends with the circling of a shrine and the first of several goat sacrifices, one on each of the ways into the settlement. Strips of their skin tied across entrances to Sukkur bar evil from entering and thus Sukkur is ritually and practically prepared for the month on which their livelihood for the following year depends. Sukkur's ninth month is dry and cool, time to harvest, and be harvested as the district head visits to update the tax rolls. While on the plain, the last mats are trucked to the towns, the main harvest begins on the mountain. The grain, left in the field to dry, is protected by charms. Sweet potatoes will be stored in pits. But life holds more than work. Twins, spiritually powerful but fragile, have been born in a Sukkor village on the plain. After two months, they are welcomed into society.
As her husband's kin dance on the courtyard roof, the twin's mother climbs to her rooftop granary. <laughs> Up on the mountain, baskets are being given their final touches. Plagama stretches and oils a sheepskin he has tanned and will tailor as a loinskin. Smith musicians of the Higgy people are arriving for the funeral of the old lady whom we saw buried during the rains. dances in the fig tree that used to shade them both. On Christmas Day, women of the Protestant church perform a nativity play. Afterwards, they sing hymns in the Hausa language. The month ends with the bringing home of the staple grains. In the tenth month, the dusty, desiccating harmattan blows, the bush burns, and black kites feast on rodents and insects. <laughs>
As one man compacts the base of a freestanding basketry granary, two others, one outside and one in, sew its upper parts together. <laughs> The eleventh month, women wait long at the wells. Some men specialize in making mud domes. <laughs> Once dried, the dome supports the weight of a man and protects against fire. The harvest has been good, and Chief Guzik decrees that Yawal be held, a ceremony that celebrates him and his chiefly clan, but also reconciliation with two earlier dynasties. Their representatives, Kliduf and Dalate, serve this shrine. Dalata prays, there for Jigla, health for the people, may they move around as easily as a spider in its web, their hearts pure white as millet gruel. Let them finish the feast in beauty. The chief is escorted by the sons and daughters of his clan. Klesuku offers a prayer. progress to a cluster of rocks and there dance into the night. The last and greatest day of Yawal is the fourth. The chief is formally dressed and veiled. Then a procession leads from his house, down the paved well, stopping at a shrine for prayer, an 
on to the site of the former iron market. chief is protected by warriors and by the priests of earth and water. Since Sukho was named a World Heritage Cultural Landscape, Yawal has become its public face. As for us, we have lived through the turn of the seasons and can perhaps begin to see how Sukho's technology, society and ideology as expressed in ceremonies interact to produce their cultural landscape. It is time to go down the mountain. Goodbye, or better, Lashanju, till we return.